so just real quick, some uh, interesting events that are coming down the pipeline that uh, you guys might be interested in, in, in checking out. Uh, so this Thursday, we have another talk in our time series database series. Um, we have uh, the CEO of QuasarDB, is a startup out of, I think, France and San Francisco. They are a time series database built on top of Postgres. So he's coming on Thursday to give a talk. Um, there'll be pizza there. The other thing will be on Friday, November 10th, we're having what we're calling a hackathon for Peloton. Um, if you don't, if Peloton is the, is the new system we're building here at CMU. And so for in the, all the projects in the spring class in 15721 will be based on Peloton. So if you want to get familiar with the system, prepare yourself for the, for the class in the spring. Uh, you should come maybe check it out. The idea is that we're all going to get in a room. We're going to teach you how to write a SQL function in, uh, in our system. And then you sort of team up and go off and, and implement something. And the goal is that by the end of the day, uh, we'll have a little party. And then we'll, we'll try to merge everything in. Right? So th think of things like uh, you know, substring, string length, all the sort of standard built-in SQL functions. Uh, we're we're going to try to support that. Um, the advantage I'll be so be to also say to help motivate you why you should come to this is that in the same way in this class where the first assignment was uh, determine how you got off you know the wait list into the course, the first assignment would be the same thing in the spring class because our wait list is like another 100 something people. And so rather than just you know picking people at random, uh, it'll be the order that you complete, complete the first assignment. So if you already understand how to write code in Peloton, uh, then you'll sort of be at advantage over, over other people. And also, too, if you want to do research or do a capstone project, things like that, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, sort of get, it's good to get your hands dirty on this, and then because it's, it's a bit steep, it's a steep learning curve. And then the other time series talk we'll have, the last one for the semester will be on Thursday, November 16th. Uh, we're having Timescale DB, the, one of the, the co founders, and he's a, he's a professor at Princeton. Um, they're going to come give a talk about, about their system. And Timescale is another, these, you know, another one that's built on top of Postgres. All right, so where we're at in the course now is we've already sort of gone through on the, the stack on, on, the, on the, the far side here, right, from the disk manager up to query planning. And now sort of to get, get you to understand where we're looking at, what we're looking at for the next, next couple weeks, is that we're sort of on these auxiliary things that you have inside a database system to do concurrent control, and, and recovery, and things like that. Um, so the, uh, the, where we're at here now in the, in the next couple of weeks is on concurrency control. And the, the reason why the, the concurrency control doesn't sort of fit directly into the hierarchy that I had before is that this sort of permeates throughout the entire architecture of the system, right? It's something that, uh, that all parts of the system need to understand. Uh, because in order to make sure your, your transactions run correctly and your queries run correctly, you need to make sure that uh, uh, you know, it's not just a, just a sort of standard thing, right? Like the, the query executor needs to know about this. The buffer pool manager and the disk manager need to know, know about these things, right? So that's why it's sort of on, on the side here. And look, the, this machine's now back up, so I'll start Panopto over here. So again, we're hanging out over here. Uh, the the uh, the logging recovery is essentially the same thing too, because again, in order to make sure that any changes that that transactions or queries make into the different other levels, we need to make sure that we understand what, exactly what's going on. Okay. So the other thing I want to sort of go over again real quickly from last class is the last class when we talked about concurrent control, we spent a lot of time talking about this this difference between conflict serializability and uh, view serializable schedules. Um, and I said that conflict serializable is essentially what you get when any database system says they support serializable isolation. And we'll do some demos of Postgres and MySQL, and we'll, we'll see this. Um, and what we talked about last class was really about these of, of protocols for allowing you to, um, to figure out whether you have a schedule of transactions you want to interleave their operations. Can you figure out whether that schedule of interleaving is equivalent to a serial ordering? schedule, right? Does it produce the state of the database that's equivalent to one where you executed the transactions in serial order one after other, even though we were interleaving the operations? And so, and I said before that in the case of view serializable, 
the, the main sort of example we show where, where we did blind writes and show that as long as the last write is the one that wins, we don't care what happens in between then. Uh, and then that's, that's enough to know that we, we ended up with a correct schedule. And we said that uh, the only way for the data system to know about whether it's actually doing the correct thing and achieve view serializability is if you understand what's going on inside the program. So that means you need to do, need to do program analysis or understand at a higher level what it means for something to be correct in the application. And as far as I know, no database system can do that. All right, so again, the last class was really about understanding the background of, of concurrency control, the background of what we're trying to achieve when we want to have a, a protocol that tries to achieve serializability. And so today's class is really trying to understand, well, what, what, what does one of these protocols look like, right? What do we do when we don't have the schedule ahead of time and transactions are showing up, coming and going, executing arbitrary queries, we don't know what they are ahead of time. So that's sort of, that's what the goal today is. All right, so we looked at this, this sort of simple example I had before, right? We have two schedules, or sorry, two, two transactions in our schedule, and then we have a read-write conflict here because uh, transaction T1 would do a write on A and then try to read it again, but in between that time, uh, transaction T2 wrote over the, the modification to A. So when T1 reads it, it gets back the different value, and we said, again, this, this wouldn't have happened in a serial order, uh, it, 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 and so this is technically not a serializable, this is not a serializable schedule. So what we need, though, now is a way to guarantee that all resulting schedules that the, the database system is going to execute for your transactions, right? And again, I, I, I mean this in terms of it's not a fixed schedule. Any transaction showing up at any time, it can do anything. How do we ensure that any interleaving the database system comes up with on the fly, how do we guarantee that it's a serializable schedule, or it's again equivalent to uh, a serial ordering? And so for today's class, the way we're going to do this is, is using locks on the individual database objects. So now what we're going to do is now we're going to introduce a new component in our database system called the lock manager. And the lock manager is essentially going to be the, the, the traffic cop or the, or, the, or, the, or the coordinator that makes decisions about whether a transaction is allowed to have a lock or not when it asks for one. And so what we're going to do in our protocol here is we're going to say that any time a transaction needs to access an object, either to do a read or a write, it has to first go get that lock from the lock manager. And the lock manager is going to have a global view of what's going on inside, inside the system, what threads are running, what transactions are running, and it knows who, who holds what, what's locks, and then can decide whether you're allowed to have that lock or not. So let's say now we, we start off in T1. It, it wants to do a read on A, so it has to go to the lock manager and get, get the lock on A first. In this case here, assume there's no other transaction running at the same time, so the lock manager grants that lock to T1 on A. And then now T2 starts, and it wants to get the lock on A, and it goes to the lock manager. The lock manager is going to deny this because that lock is already being held. So in this case, what will happen is the request will actually stall inside the lock manager, and essentially this, this, this transaction thread is just blocked. Right? It's waiting to be notified later on that it can go ahead and get that lock. Right? So then now, in case it, the control goes back to T1, T1 will do the write on A and then read on A, and then when it's finished, it goes ahead and, and releases that lock. Um, and then now at this point, the lock manager can say, all right, well, T2, you were asking for A, now you go ahead and can have it. And it does its read and write on A, and then it goes, and then it does, uh, and, and releases it. All right? So this is essentially what we're going we're to talk about today, but we're going to actually talk about how, actually how do you do this for real, because what I'm describing here is actually incorrect. All right? It's not going to solve all the problems that we're going to want to solve. So for today's class, we're going to first start off talking about uh, the different types of locks you can have. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the main protocol for today's class is called two-phase locking, which is actually the first concurrency to a protocol that was developed in the 1970s by, of course, IBM on system R. Um, this was the first provably correct concurrency to a protocol. Um, it's actually probably the most widely used protocol as well. And then we'll talk about how to deal with deadlocks, and then we'll finish up talking about expanding two-phase locking to now do what's called hierarchical locking, or, or multi-granularity locking, where we can have, take locks on not just individual tuples, but actually uh, tables or pages or rows, right? We can have different, different granularities, okay? So real quick, I don't think we discussed this at the beginning of the, of the, of the, the semester, but I, I might have mentioned this. 
Um, but it's important from a database perspective to make this distinction between locks and latches, right? So everything we're going to talk about today, we're talk when we say locks, we mean logical locks on database objects. So in database parlance, if you say I, I'm taking a lock, you really mean sort of like you know, a lock on, a, on, a, on an object. And so the idea of what the lock's going to do is gonna it's going to protect, uh, it says index, but it protects the logical context of some object from other transactions running the system. And we're going to hold our, our locks for the duration of the, tr the entire transaction. It's not exactly true. We'll see as we, go, as we go along. But it's sort of this higher level thing. The transaction has locks, right? And the key, though, is that if there is a problem in the locks that we're trying to acquire or any changes that we make, then it's up to the trans transaction's responsibility to, to roll back those changes. And, then, and it's actually all it's the database system's responsibility. But I mean, what I mean by that is it's the, the, there isn't a low-level thread that needs to go ahead and, and roll back these changes right? at the moment that, that there's a problem. The database system can do this at, at a higher level. And then I mentioned latches definitely earlier in the semester, but the latches are, are sort of the low-level mutex primitive that we're going to use to uh, protect the critical sections of, of the database. So you guys had to do this in, when you put your hash table. right? You could have multiple threads coming at the same time. You, you take latches to protect the hash table so that you can have concurrent readers and writers or do things in a safe manner. Right? And so the way to sort of think about this is that our lock manager is going to have its own hash table uh, to store the information about locks that it holds. So you have to take latches to enter the hash table then, to then acquire locks on other aspects of, of the database. In the case of uh, when we take latches, we don't have to roll back a bunch of changes because it's sort of like we go in, do the one thing we want to do. If we're denied because the latch is being held by somebody else, then we just either spin and wait or just abort our changes. Right? So there's this great table from a paper, a survey paper from Gertz Graffy, the guy who came up with the volcano stuff we talked about earlier. Uh, where he sort of goes through all the different aspects of the difference between the locks and the latches. Um, and so in the, today's class, we're really focusing on this, right? right? The locks are going to protect uh, database objects from other transactions, and we're going to hold them for that entire transactions in these different modes. And then we've got to use different ways to handle the deadlocks, whereas in latches, it's sort of, again, a low-level mutex and that you're going to put in, in your data structure. So for this class, we're focusing on, on this column here. In the advanced class, we'll talk more about how you implement different latches like that. OK, so in my first example that I showed, uh, when tr transactions were taking locks, we, we just had a single lock for, for the object. Right? But in actuality, you can have different types of locks. Right? And this can increase the amount of parallelism in, 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 your, in your database system, because now you can have possibly two transactions reading the same object. And as long as they're just reading it, then the, you can do that in parallel. Right? And so in our data system, we're going to have a notion of shared locks and exclusive locks. So shared lock, again, is for reads. Exclusive locks are for writes. And then there's this compatibility matrix that says if one transaction holds one kind of lock on an object and another transaction wants to acquire another lock uh, on that object, which ones can be acquired at the same time? Right? And it's sort of obvious. Right? The shared lock can be, can be shared with shared locks. And the exclusive lock can't be shared with anything. Right? So now, when transactions want to execute, uh, they're going to go to the lock manager. They're going to say, I, I need a lock on this particular object. It, it has to say what type it is. And then the transaction manager or the lock manager will make a decision about whether to allow that transaction to acquire that lock. And therefore, it can go off and do whatever it is it needs to do. And then at some point, the, the transaction will say, all right, I'm, I'm done with what I need to do. I'll go ahead and release those locks back to the lock manager. And then the, the lock manager can then assign them or give them out to other, other, uh, to other, um, other transactions. And the lock manager has this internal lock table, which you'll end up building in the third project, that basically just says, all right, for this, for this database object, here's the queue of transactions that either hold the lock or are waiting to acquire their lock. So if we go back to this ex our example that I had before, uh, now we're going to introduce different types of locks. Uh, we can see that in T1, they'll take an exclusive lock on A. It goes ahead and does what it needs to do. And then when it's done, it'll go ahead and, un and unlock it. Transaction T2 then starts. It takes exclusive lock on A, goes ahead and does the write, but then it goes ahead and unlocks it. And now transaction T1 wants to read on A, so it takes the shared lock on A, gets it because nobody else holds it, 
does the read, and, gets, and does the unlock. All right, what's the problem here? The same thing we saw earlier. Right, it's an unrepeatable read. T1 is going to read A here, uh, but it's not reading the, the A that it wrote, it's reading the A that T2 wrote. But in our locking protocol, this, you know, that we showed before, where you just lock and unlock as you need, right, this is technically allowed to happen. But we know it's not serializable, right? All right, so we have a conflict here. Right, we should be really reading our own write or reading this other write, and which shouldn't happen if, if you execute this in serial order. So this is telling us that although just having a lock manager and different types of locks isn't enough, we actually need, um, by the way, battery's running low. Awesome. All right, should be good, sorry. My battery's running, running low. Oh, is it? Sorry. <laughs> All right, so this is telling us again, this is telling us that we, we just can't let transactions lock and unlock as, as we go along. We, we actually need a protocol that says when should things be allowed to happen. And this is what a concurrent to a protocol does. And this is what two-phase locking is going to do for us, right? It's the rules in which transactions are allowed to acquire and locks, uh, acquire and release locks when they're, when they're running. Um, and we're going to enforce this in such a way that, we're, that we can guarantee that the end result of, of the database will be equivalent to one where we executed them in serial order, right? And the key thing about what we're talking about today versus last class is that we don't have to know what the, the schedule is at the very beginning in order to make any decisions. We can do this on the fly as transactions come and go and execute queries. Okay? So, two-phase locking, as the name implies, has two phases. So the first phase is called the growing phase. And this is where the transaction is going to request all the locks that it needs from the lock manager, and the lock manager then decides whether it's allowed to have them or not based on you know, what other transactions are holding those locks and what types of locks they are, right? If you're trying to acquire a shared lock and it's being held by somebody else with a shared lock, it, it lets you have it. And the second phase is called the shrinking phase. And this occurs immediately after the transaction releases its first lock, right? So if I acquire a bunch of locks, do whatever I need to do, and then if I and go back to the lock manager and say, all right, I don't need this lock anymore, you immediately enter the shrinking phase. And when you're in the shrinking phase, you're not allowed to acquire any new locks. You can only release locks. Right? If you try to acquire a lock, the, the, the lock manager will basically deny you and abort your transaction. Right? So visually, it sort of looks like this. Right? So say along the y-axis, we have the number of locks that, that my transaction is acquiring over time. And so in the growing phase, I can keep acquiring locks and adding more and more and more. And at some point, I release a lock. And then I enter, I enter the shrinking phase. So the way this is sort of actually implemented you know, at, at an application level, it's not like you go tell the hints to the database system in SQL, say, you know, I'm now in the growing phase, do this. I'm now in the shrinking phase, do that. Right? This is an internal thing the database system is going to maintain to figure out what phase, phase you're in. And the lock manager can then decide, oh, if you've never released a lock before, I'll let you acquire this new one. Or if as soon as you release one, then if you try to acquire a new one, then I'll stop you and abort you. All right? So the way you think, sort of think about this is that you can't, you can't do this. You can't release a bunch of locks and then actually try to acquire more because this would be a violation of the two-phase locking protocol. Right? So now let's go back to our example that I showed before. Right? And now what will happen is T1 will start. It takes the exclusive lock on A, does the read on write, right? and then there's a uh, context switch over to T2. It tries to acquire the exclusive lock on A. But T1 hasn't given that up yet, so it's denied, and therefore it stalls. Um, and then once T, T1 releases that lock, T, T2 is then allowed to start running, uh, and then do the update, and then it releases its own lock. Right? Now, is this, is this equivalent to a serial ordering? Yes, right, because there's no uh, unrepeatable reads, right? T1 reads its own write. Uh, there's, no, there's no lost updates, right? So this is good, right? So on its own, two-phase locking, as, 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 I'm, as, as I'm describing it, is sufficient to guarantee that any schedule or any interleaving of the operations in, for arbitrary number of transactions, it guarantees that it'll produce schedules that are conflict serializable, right? And the way you sort of think about this and what we talked about last class, it means that any schedule that we generate will have a dependency graph or a precedence graph 
that will be acyclic. There'll be no cycles between different transactions in those graphs. But the downside of, of two-phase locking, as I'm describing here, is that it is susceptible to what are called cascading aborts. So let's go back here. So transaction T1 wants to do a read on A, then write on A, then read on B, and write on B. And then transaction T2 wants to do a read on A, then write on A. So in this case here, T1 starts and acquires the lock on, uh, excludes the lock on A and B at the very beginning. And then when it uh, does, does this update on A, it goes ahead and releases the lock. And then this allows transaction T2 to then acquire the exclusive lock on A. But then later on, T2, after it does the write on B, it's going to abort. But at this point here, uh, T2 read the, the, the modification made by T1, right? Uh, because it was allowed to do this because it was allowed to get the exclusive lock on A um, and read, read the change, even though that transaction ha has, has not committed yet. So in this case here, when T1 aborts, the database system is going to know that T2 read the, the value of A that was written to by T1, but then T1 aborted, and therefore that value should never have been written in the first place. And then now we have to go back and delete T2. Yes? Right, so his question is, how is, how is the data system going to know that T2 read something from T1, T1 hasn't, hasn't aborted yet? Right, so internally, the data system is going to know what is the last transaction that made this change on this tuple, right? It's just, it's, it stores it in the internal, internal metadata, right? And it'll know that, all right, this, this tuple was modified by this transaction. If T2 tried to commit, say, right before this read on B, the data system would actually stall it and say, well, you actually truly can't commit until we find out what happens from, from T2, right? Because otherwise, this would have been, this is technically a dirty read, right? Because you're reading something from a transaction that hasn't committed yet. So if we want to be serializable, we can't have T2 commit and then tell the outside world, the external, the external world, oh, yeah, here's the value of A. Because technically, it, should, it doesn't exist yet because T, T1 hasn't committed, right? If we're trying to be serializable, then we don't want this to happen. When we talk about isolation levels, you can't allow that to happen. Uh, because right, you assume these, these things are rare. But in this case here, if you, if you want to be truly correct and follow serializable ordering or serializable schedules, then we can't, we can't have T2 tell the outside world about any value it read from T1, because T1 technically has not finished. In this case here, we know that it aborts. Right? So the issue, oh yeah. Do you abort T2 or do you just like restart it? His question is, do you abort T2 or do you restart it? It's a good question. So it, it depends on how it was executed. If it's a stored procedure, then you can just go ahead and restart it because you know exactly uh, all the program logic you need to re-execute. If it's done through SQL, then you can try to be smart, maybe roll back to some, you know, right before the read. If, if, you know, if there's some queries before that, you may roll, roll that back. Uh, the, in general, though, most database systems, if you're not doing store procedure, it'll just abort you. If you're a store procedure, you can restart. All right, so, uh, okay, so the issue again here is that this is all wasted work because we assumed that T1 was not going to abort, so we, we let T2 go ahead and get that lock and then do read on A and write on, write on A. But now we abort, we've got to roll that back and then maybe do it over again. Right? So if we always have this where T1 is, is aborting and T2 is reading the changes that, that T1 made, right, then we're just, we're just burning cycles doing nothing. Right? So this is what a cascading abort is. So uh, in the case of 2PL, we're going to have the possibility of, of, of these dirty reads and these cascading aborts. So we have to do, deal with something, handle that, and that'll be strict two-phase locking, which I'll show in the next, next slide. Um, the other thing I'll say about 2PL as well is that there are going to be some situations where you could allow the interleaving uh, in a certain way um, that would still be serializable, but two-phase locking the protocol itself would not, actually not allow you to do that. So we can easily come up with a bunch of examples on the whiteboard and say, here's how, you know, here's, if, you, if you interleave things in this way, that'll still be serializable, but the two-phase locking protocol won't, won't allow you to do that. 
right? The last problem we have to deal with also is deadlocks, and we'll talk more about that in, in a few slides. Right? So the thing we want to handle is that cascading aborts, these are dirty reads, uh, which are allowed under regular two-phase locking. Two -phase, you just have to make sure that no transaction actually commit until the transaction that modified data that you wrote actually commits. So you sort of hold them in a, in a waiting area to figure out what the result is for, for the, the writing transaction. But with strict two-phase locking, what we're going to do now instead is we actually don't never release any locks. Uh, while a transaction runs, we only release them immediately at, at the moment that they commit. So this is sort of always confusing for students sometimes, right? There's, there's the growing phase still where you keep acquiring locks, right? But you never actually give them up. It's only when the transaction go, goes ahead and, 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 and commits, at that moment do you actually release, release all the locks you hold. So there's not really a shrinking phase because you're not incrementally you know, giving these things back as you run. It's just you go ahead and commit and then poof, everything goes back, right? So the first thing we now need to define is like, what does it mean to be strict, right? Because this is actually a, a, a real term in, in critical theory. So we're going to say that a, a schedule is strict if any value written to an object by transaction uh, will not be read or overwritten by any other transaction running at the same time until that first transaction actually commits. So in my case before, where the transaction T2 was allowed to read the write from transaction T1, under strict two-phase locking, that's not going to be allowed to happen because transaction T1 didn't commit yet, right? And we can enforce this because we take the exclusive lock on the object in order to do our write. Strict two-phase locking says you'll hold that to the very end so nobody can run until you actually commit. So again, the advantages of this uh, strict two-phase locking over regular two-phase locking is that it, we're not going to have any cascading aborts because, again, no one can read our, our dirty writes. Um, and when we actually abort a transaction, it's actually really easy to do a rollback because you just take exactly whatever the, the before values of the objects you wrote to, and you just over, 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 you know, put them over top of the, of the, of, of the, 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 the objects you want to roll back. Right? In the case of two-phase locking, because you could have these different dependencies of this transaction read from this transaction, this transaction has committed, but he read from this other transaction, right? you could have to do a bunch of chaining to go back and how to roll back to the actual correct value, right? So that's a bit tricky. Yes? Does it mean that, like, uh, the, the strict to phase locking takes more time if you don't like the board again? So his question, his, I think your question is, um, could it increase the latency of transactions because now um, T2 has to wait, has to wait for T1 to finish before it's even allowed to read. Yes. So another way to rephrase this is that strict two-phase locking is more restrictive in what schedules they allow, what, what interleavings they allow. And they're, do, and they're doing this because they're reducing the amount of parallelism, potential parallelism you can have. So I was wondering why you consider this advantage. Advantage that what? There's no cascading abort? So again, you can easily contrive a scenario like the, my example before, where you always have cascading aborts, and the data system keeps burning through cycles and never, never get anything actually done. So we don't, like, know if you will abort Right, but I'm saying you could have a workload that does that. Right? Okay. So let's look, look at an example here. So this is my favorite example. So I have a gambling problem, so we want to take $50 out of my account, and we want to put it into my bookie's account. And then for, and that's the first transaction. And the second transaction, we're going to compute the total amount of, of accounts that the bookie has. And then we're going to return that to the application. Right? So in this case here, it's, 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 we have a bit more logic now. Right? And we have a, a bit more uh, you know, locks and unlocks. And then there's this little bit here, as I sort of showed in the last example, where I'm saying echo A plus B. This is sort of a way to spit this out to the, to the, to, to the, to the client. Um, and again, this is not something you actually really do in SQL. Think of this as the, the return statement of the transaction, right? This will happen in a transaction safe manner. Maybe it should come before, actually, it should come, maybe come after the, the commit, right? All right, so our initial database state is that uh, my account has $100 and my bookie's account has, has $100. So the first thing we see is that in the case of T1, it acquires the exclusive lock on A. So when T2 wants to acquire the share lock on A, that'll get denied because uh, uh, you know, somebody else already holds the lock. So I also say, this is, this is running this example without, without any two-phase locking. And so 
Then when this guy tries to do the exclusive lock, that gets denied. But then now our final output is A plus B equals 150, right? Because what will happen is I'll take the money out on T1 here, then read A there, then uh, update the, 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 the total, right? At that point, there's an extra $50, or sorry, there's $50 missing in A's account that, that's not put in B's account yet. So now when I get my final output here, I get I'm missing $50, right? So in this case here, the, the, the output is not correct. But now under, with two-phase locking, then what we get is that the shared lock on A gets, gets, gets denied. Um, the, uh, the, the T1 then is able to take, take the, the money out of uh, A and then get the, get the suits lock on B, then unlock A, then put the money in B, and then unlock B. So at no point here in under two-phase locking is the second transaction able to actually read the intermediate state of A and B during this operation, right? So then it always produces the correct output. And then strict two-phase locking essentially looks basically like a serial ordering because I'll get the exclusive lock on, on A and B in T1, and then T2 will have to basically sit and wait for, for transaction T1 to unlock both of these things. And then it's allowed to do the read uh, on, on A and B and then produce our, our correct output, right? So again, Strict two-phase lock, sorry, two-phase locking is going to allow a little bit more interleaving, but it's susceptible for cascading aborts, but it still guarantees that the, the interleaving will always be equivalent to a serial ordering, right? That it's a, it's, it always produces a serializable schedule. In strict two-phase locking, you want to avoid cascading aborts because you assume that that's going to be a very expensive thing to do, and therefore you, that's sort of wasting work. And so you're going to limit concurrency, but then it essentially always ends up being something that's very similar to a, a straight serial ordering. Yes? Uh, so, like, regardless of whatever protocol you're using, at what level does a protocol get enforced? Is it at the transaction generation level, or is it within the lock? So his question is, where, where does this actually thing get, get enforced? It's put inside the lock manager, right? So the lock manager will know, all right, your transaction T1, I've seen you before, you have a lock on these things, and now you're trying to acquire a lock or release a lock, and based on what you're trying to do, and who you are, it can decide, yeah, go, you're, here's the lock, you're allowed to have it, or I'll stall, you have to stall and wait. But is it not feasible to just like never pass a transaction that like tries to like get the lock to be released? Like, is that possible? Wait, say it again. Is it feasible to do what? Sorry? Like, is it feasible to just like never like pass the schedule to the lock manager that tries to say like acquire a lock after that schedule has done something? What do you mean by schedule? Like, Uh, so his question is, does, does this, so how do I say this? Um, so when SQL, you're not going to write lock and unlock, right. right? So the way to think about this is like the database system sees these reads and writes. Okay. So the read basically gets expanded to be, oh, lock, get a shared lock on this, then go ahead and do the read, okay. right? And so what the lock manager, the lock manager is not seeing, oh, I need a share lock on this, and oh, by the way, I'm gonna, I'm, need, I'm gonna do a bunch of other stuff later on. It only sees that single request for that one lock at that moment of time, right? Okay. But I think you have to look ahead and see if you have a write at all before you decide what you should do. So his, his question is, can you look ahead in your transaction and say, well, I, I'm reading this now, but I know I'm gonna need to do a write later, so maybe I'll get an exclusive lock now? Yes. So, right. So, what would happen is that you actually do what's called lock upgrading or lock escalation. So, basically, if I take a shared lock in T1 on A, then I read it and I say, oh, I actually need to write on this now. Then you can go to the lock manager and say, hey, I had a shared lock before in A, but now give me a write lock. And then it can decide at that point whether uh, to grant you that lock, because nobody else holds a shared lock. Or you can decide that somebody else holds a shared lock and they have a higher priority than you, which we'll discover, discuss what that is in a second. Uh, and then, therefore, you're denied and you get aborted. Or it can, it can commit murder, kill the other transaction, steal its lock, and give it back to you. Right? It can do all, all those three things. In some cases, too, as well, we'll see at the end, you actually can provide hints to the Davis system to say, all right, I'm doing a read now. 
but I'm going to know I'm going to update it later on in my transaction. So actually, take a re take a write lock now. Right? It's called select for update, and we'll show that in a second. Yes. So his statement is, uh, the data system doesn't know exactly when the transaction is. Okay, so uh, a couple of things. So how do I start a transaction? Is that the first question? Yeah, yeah. Right, so, so we, we can open Postgres. You just call begin, right? Uh, I think another, maybe what you may be asking is like, are there any cases where the, the data systems could be told, here's exactly what my transaction is going to do ahead of time and therefore make, help you make decisions? So that's a whole other area of databases called deterministic databases, all right? Uh, this actually came out of Yale, was, was sort of the, the early pioneers in this. And there actually is one startup called FaunaDB which actually does do this, right? The, what I'm talking about here are sort of dynamic protocols where you don't know anything about what transactions are going to do later on. You just know that it wants to do a read, it wants to do a write, and then you make decisions about whether it can have those locks or, like right now or deny them, okay? Okay. All right, so if we go back to this view of all the universal schedules we had before. Uh, the, the no cascading aborts is sort of this middle area here. Right? And then within side of complex serializable that we have, we have strict 2PL. Right? Because strict 2PL, again, doesn't have cascading aborts, and it's always complex serializable, but it's not always going to be an exact serial, serial schedule. Right? It's sort of, it's a, it's a superset of serial orderings. Right? And two-phase locking would be uh, the complex serializable regions that are outside of the, the no cascading aborts regions. Right? Sometimes it will be no cascading aborts, sometimes uh, th it can occur. Okay? All right, so this is the sort of what I talked about before. Here's my observations about 2PL. And the issue you have to deal with now are, are deadlocks. Right? And we'll talk about how we're going to do this. All right, so let's say we have a really simple example. We have a two transactions, T1, T2, and they both want to do a read on A and then a, a read on B. So uh, we get the exclusive lock on, on A and T1. We get a shared lock on, on B. And then now this guy wants to get a share lock on A, but it can't because T1 has an exclusive lock, so it gets denied and has to wait. And then this guy wants to get an exclusive lock on B, it gets denied because T2 has a share lock on that. So at this point, we have a deadlock, right? Because they're both waiting for the locks held by the other guy, and they're not going to give up their locks until they, something happens, right? Until they commit, right? So this is what we actually need to deal with, right? Strict two-phase locking, uh, and both strict two-phase locking and regular two-phase locking uh, can have this problem, so we need, we need something, right? And so, again, sort of an abstract way to think about this is, again, the deadlock is just a cycle in a sort of a, this, this graph of what transactions are waiting for other transactions, um, so we need to figure out how to break that. And so there's two ways we're going to deal with this in two-phase locking. The first is what is called deadlock detection, the second is called deadlock prevention. So deadlock detection is basically, uh, you're going to let transactions acquire locks in any way that they want, right? I mean, you, you obviously deny them if someone else already holds it, but you, you, you're let, you just let them wait indefinitely because you, you hope that maybe somebody will, the, the transaction that is going to hold, the holding the lock they need, they'll actually finish it up, and then you, you can go ahead and now acquire that lock and, and be able to run, right? And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to have a separate thread run in the background that will periodically check the, the lock table inside the lock manager and look for these, these cycles and this wait for a grab. Look, look for these dependencies. And then it's going to have to make a decision about when it detects a cycle, which transaction should it abort in order to break that cycle, because that transaction that gets aborted will release all its locks, and any other transaction that was waiting to acquire those locks can go ahead and now acquire them. So, sort of visually, look at an example like this, right? So we have T2, T1 is waiting for T2, and so we build this wait for a graph to say T1 has a dependency on T2, right? T2 has a dependency on T3, T3 has a dependency on T1, so this is obviously a, a deadlock. So what we're going to want to figure out how to do is we're going to pick one of these three transactions, kill them, and then that releases their locks, and then that frees up this, this cycle, and then we can start making forward, forward pro progress again. But as you can imagine, this is actually very complicated to do because there's a bunch of different decisions that we have to figure out 
uh, in our implementation in order to do this correctly. Right? There's things like how often should we actually run the algorithm? Like, should we be running this every 10 minutes? No, because anytime there's a deadlock, then we're waiting 10 minutes, right? But maybe you don't want to run every microsecond or every, every millisecond because now you're just burning cycles looking through all the time to figure out whether you have a deadlock, right? In Postgres, I think the default is one second. In MySQL, the default is 10 seconds, right? And this is something you can tune, right? You can tune this based on what you think your application needs. Uh, and then there's a bunch of questions like, well, how many transactions could possibly be in a deadlock and how, for, how much should I be looking? Um, and then we've got to figure out, all right, once we find a deadlock, which transaction do we actually want to kill? All right, so the first thing is that when we figure out a victim, uh, there's a bunch of different uh, metrics or def different uh, characteristics about transactions that we can use when we make a decision on which transaction is going to be our eviction. And then sort of related to Gus's question earlier, well, what happens if you abort a transaction? All right, do you just restart it from the beginning or you just start, restart the last query? Or maybe there's the few queries that are, that are holding you up? All right, depends on how the application actually invoked your transaction. If it's a stored procedure, you just you roll back the whole thing and just start it from beginning to end. Right, to start from the very beginning, because you know exactly the entry point of the transaction. If it's done through SQL, like JDBC or ODBC, then you have no way of sort of rolling back the program code to go back to the point where you know, they started the transaction in their PHP or Java code. So you send back an exception to say, all right, your, your transaction got aborted uh, because of a deadlock. Please, do, you know, please restart it. And then you and your application code have to write the, you know, write the, the handling of that and be able to, and be able to restart it. I can't prove this, but it's, it's my conjecture that I, I'm thinking most people don't actually do this, right? And that's, sometimes you see 500 errors or you know, random errors on websites because they may not be handling their, their, their you know, deadlocks correctly in their transactions. All right, so to do victim selection, there's a bunch of different things we, we can consider. Uh, we do things like picking the transaction that is either the oldest or the newest, right? The idea here is that if it's the newest transaction, then you can maybe restart it a couple of times without really anyone noticing that the transaction is getting delayed. Um, you pick the oldest, it's, uh, you know, has, has, has other implications. Uh, you can try to do this based on how many queries they've already executed. So again, so if I've, already, if I've executed a million queries in my transaction and I'm deadlocked on another transaction that's only executed one query, well, it, it's probably better to abort them because rolling me back and actually rerunning everything would be a lot of work. Right? Um, but it also could depend on you know, what, what, what you actually did. If one's just doing a bunch of reads and one's another doing a bunch of writes, you, know, you make, make, make decisions based on that. You can make decisions based on the number of locks that, that the transaction already holds. Right? So if I have a million locks already, it's a big pain to go acquire those things because you have to go in the lock manager and run the protocol. But if another guy already has one lock, then it may be cheaper to go ahead and, and unlock them. But they may have a lock that nobody actually cares about, and I have a ton of locks that could break a lot of deadlocks, maybe you want to abort the other guy, right? So there's a bunch of, bunch of those things you have to consider. And then there's like, because we, if we're not doing strict two-phase locking, and we could have cascading aborts, if I roll back a transaction, that may cause a bunch of other transactions to get rolled back, and therefore it'd be a lot more work to abort me versus, versus the other person, right? And then above all, above all else, related to the age, is like if I've been restarted a ton of times, then maybe I don't want to be restarted again, right? It's some threshold where I say, oh, I, I got to get this thing going uh, to reduce my latency, so I'll go ahead and let it proceed, maybe kill the other guy, right? So this, the, the main takeaway from this is that there's a whole bunch of different choices you can make for picking a victim. And not, there's not one that I can point to you and say, this is exactly what you want to use that's going to be best for all cases, right? Depends on the application. Depends on what other transactions are running at the same time. Depends on what your SLAs or SLOs are for, for you know, meeting requirements about latency for transactions. It's a whole bunch of different things. And the, at least in the case of the commercial systems, you can basically tune all these different knobs, right? You can tell it what, exactly what deadlock detection or victim selection protocol you want to use, right? It's, and it's, it's a very complicated piece of the system. Then we have this other question is like, all right, how do we deal, how do we decide how far we actually want to roll back? So the two choices are basically just, again, abort the transaction in its entirety and, uh, and go ahead and, and, and you know, re rerun it again. Or maybe you can roll back just the, the one query that's causing the deadlock 
keep all the other queries they've already executed, let the transaction keep on running, then now when they maybe try to acquire that lock again, in between that time, the other transaction they were, they were deadlocked on has already got the lock, did its update, released those locks, so now when you come back and try to get it again for that same query, now you're allowed to go ahead and, and acquire it. Right? And different database systems do different things. So with that, let's do a demo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into, um, in theory, if it, if, it, if it loads, Have we see that? Cool. All right, so I'm going to do this in Postgres first, and I'll do this in um, in MySQL second. Actually, let's do, let's do MySQL first. So I have a simple table. Um, that has uh, two columns. Right? It has an ID and a value. And I'm going to do this in two terminals because um, we want to run transactions at the same time. Right? And in the contents of this is just there's two tuples. I got to mute that, sorry. Right? I, let's get, get rid of that last one. Delete from. Okay, so what we'll do first is that uh, we're going to set in MySQL, we're going to set our isolation level to be serializable, right? So th this is by default, MySQL is not serializable, but so we're going to say we want all transactions to run with full serializable protections. And then what we're also going to do is we're going to set our timeout for our deadlock detection to be 10 seconds, okay? So what we'll do is we'll start a new transaction at the top, start a new transaction at the bottom. And what we're going to do is the first transaction is going to update the first tuple in our table. And the bottom one is going to update the second tuple. All right? So now you can see here, if I go do select star from, from the table, actually it doesn't let me do this because I can't read the table because the other transaction holds an exclusive lock on the tuple that it modified, so therefore it's, it, it denies my, my guy at the bottom here. And then we, did, we, we, we got timed out because we couldn't acquire the lock on the other guy, right? So we can roll that back now. I need to mute this, sorry. Okay. All right, so let's roll this guy back too. Let's try it again. So we'll do begin, begin. This guy updates the first tuple. This guy updates the second tuple. And now this guy is going to try to update the, uh, the second tuple as well. Right? So what should happen here? has to wait because, because the, the bottom transaction holds the exclusive lock on, on record two. So it's going to try to acquire it and it gets stalled. Then we go down here and now we try to do the same thing, right? It tried to acquire the lock on the other guy, but it recognized right away that there would be a deadlock. So go ahead and actually tells you that it actually got denied, right? And then my guy at the top was actually then able to acquire that exclusive lock. So then it was allowed to run. So real quick, so I would say, in MySQL, when they do a rollback, they actually roll back on the last statement that calls the problem. So my transaction here at the bottom, this is actually still active. So I can still insert into the table um, a new value. Right? In Postgres, we'll see in a second, Postgres rolled back the entire transaction. And now if I go back also to, and I do a select from the table, 
and I look at my own thing I modified, so I, mod I modified the second tuple, I can read my write, right? This is all still inside the same transaction, so my change is still there. Yes? So, um, to go back up a little bit in the lower terminal, so it detected a deadlock immediately. It didn't wait until the 10 second timeout. Yeah, in this case here, it, 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 maybe I'm setting it wrong. It killed it right away. Yeah, they, they, they might be doing that. They're, yeah, they might be checking real quickly to see whether there's something there. All right. Um, question over there. Yes. Uh, the first one, could you repeat how the update, say, actually updated and then, you know, like, wait for the log to get released? Well, you, you want to do what? Sorry? How, how, how did this thing got delayed and then got released? Yeah. Okay. So what happened was, um, roll back here, roll back here. All right. So now if I go back and do a select star from, from the we're back to where we were before. Like both, oh. Might be auto commit. All right, that's that's fine. Okay, so let's we'll start a new transaction. Start a new transaction. All right, so this guy is going to update the first tuple, right? This guy updates the second tuple. Right. That again, they both transactions acquire exclusive locks on those two records that are, that, are, that are distinct. So therefore, there's no conflicts. All right. So now this guy is going to try to acquire the lock on the second tuple in order to update it. Right. And it stalls. Right. And so down here now, if I roll back my transaction, I kill it. Uh, the the immediately you see the top terminal gets released. Right. Because it. The, the exclusive lock that this transaction was holding at the bottom gets released. The lock manager says, oh, well, I know the top guy was waiting for this. Now you can have it. And then it immediately gets, gets to do his update. Right? Again, internally, the lock, lock manager has a table and says, I know what transactions are waiting for this, this lock. As soon as that lock on the bottom is released, the top guy can go ahead and get it and then does the update. Right? Wait, say it again? Sorry. Yeah, I, I think, that, I don't know if that was actually still in the same transaction. It might have, the fact that like I rolled back my insert and it still allowed it to happen. Well, but this, does that mean this top transaction has now released? No, so the top guy still holds the locks for both of those tuples. So now the bottom, again, if, uh, this, if, this, if I should be running in serializable isolations, make sure I do this correctly. Um, so I start new transaction here. Now when I do this, select from transaction demo, this actually, I think, I, this will get denied, or this, this will stall because it can't acquire any of the locks up, up there, right? So now if I commit this transaction, the bottom guy will get released, and then it'll, you'll immediately see all the changes that the top guy made. Well, it, it timed out now, so I missed it. But now here, like, right, I... I saw, the, I see 102 there, I see 202 there, right? All right, so this is, this is my SQL. Let's go to Postgres now. And so we'll do the same thing. Yes, question. Yeah, well, what happens if you have a, a mixed workload where some things are in transactions, some things are not? Is it just no, no guarantee on whatever is not a guarantee? So his question, is, his question is, what happens when some things are redone in the context of a transaction and other things are done outside of transaction? Well, the way it actually gets implemented is any query that's by itself is actually a single, single query transaction. So all the same protections that you would expect will, will, should, will be there, right? And I, we can, I can show that in, real quickly. All right, so now and what we're going to do is we're going to set, I forgot to roll back my transaction, sorry. So in, in Postgres, I'm going to set my deadlock timeout to be 10 seconds, right? And so now I'm going to do the same thing. And the Postgres, the syntax is different. Like the way you start a transaction on the serializable isolation level, you just say begin transaction, isolation level, serializable. Right? So I'll do that here. And then I'm going to do the same thing I had before. The top guy will do a, um, make sure actually my two, what my, should have make sure my database looks correct. Right? So that, that's what, you know, the, the table looks like that. We're back in the original form. So let me start over. 
All right. All right, so the first guy is going to do the update on tuple 1. Second guy does the update on tuple 2. Top guy wants to do an update on tuple 2. What should happen? Has to wait, right? Bottom guy wants to do an update on tuple 1. Right? What should happen here? So it's deadlock, but in this case here, uh, it eventually got, you know, got killed there. So it looks like it looks like it, 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 wait, sorry, it killed the bottom one. The top guy then gets the exclusive lock and is allowed to do in the update, right? And so in this case here, Postgres is going to roll back the entire transaction. So we actually can't run any query against the table. It'll deny us and say, you're actually in a, an aborted transaction. You can't do anything to, to your rollback, right? Whereas MySQL let, sort of let me, was, was letting me do that. So here's another good point, too. So his question was, what happens if you execute a, a query that's not in a transaction, right? So I do select star from transaction demo. What should happen here? All right. What's that? Yeah, so the top guy still has the right locks. It's actually a bit more complicated. Uh, so Postgres is using, uh, it's using timestamps to figure out the order of, of, of snapshots. So it's saying at this point the top guy hasn't, uh, the top guy hasn't committed yet. So therefore, reading this is actually correct because it's the state of the database as it existed before the top guy actually made any changes, right? So now if I go to the top and I commit this, now when I go to the bottom, right, I see my updates, right? So, so yeah, so I literally in Postgres, what it'll do is like when you get a query by itself, they add begin to commit to it, right? As if it was a transaction. Essentially, what you're doing, all right? Because you have snapshots. Yeah, the way we'll talk about multi-verging later on timestamp ordering in, in a few other classes. The way Postgres implements their version of this is that it allows you to read old data, whereas in MySQL, they would, would block you. Yeah, so, so this, yeah, his question is, if you don't care about uh, acquiring locks, because you, you want to execute a complex query that reads a bunch of data and would block everybody else, can you turn this off? Yes. So I, we're not going to have time today, but I'll talk about this on, 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 on Wednesday. Um, they're called isolation levels. So you can say what, what anomalies, like the comp, like dirty reads, unrepeatable reads, what, what, which anomalies am I allowing myself to have, right, in order to get better concurrency, right? So what I can do, let's use, let's use MySQL, because that was the one that had the, um, that, that had the, uh, you know, would block the other guy. So we'll do this. We'll execute this transaction. We'll make sure that this one runs in serializable isolation. And then this guy, guy at the bottom here, We'll run what's called uh, uh, read uncommitted. So this is basically zero protection in the database system. So I can read dirty. I can have dirty reads. I can have unrepeatable reads. I can have phantoms, which, which I'll define later on, right? So now, if I start a transaction here, I'll start a transaction there, and say this is my state of the database, right? Do select star from 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 the table. Right, it looks like this. If I do that same thing, I'll see the same result on the bottom. Right? So now, but I'll do an update. Right? I'll update. Oh, because this is serializable, right? Because the bottom guy doesn't know that the, the doesn't know the other guy is going to change something. So therefore, the bottom guy has a shared lock. And therefore, this guy's trying to create an exclusive lock, so it's not going to let, let him do that, right? So the bottom one doesn't care about the protections. The top one does. So, that, so that's why the top guy got denied. So, but now let's do this. Let's, let's try this this way. So roll back my change. Start, this, start the top guy. Start the bottom one. Actually, we might need to do this here. That might be the problem. All right, so this guy will do an update. The bottom guy 
if he does a select, we'll see that update, right? See, he sees 103, right? So now what happens here? If I roll back this transaction, that change to 103 gets, gets wiped away. But now if I run this query again, wh what will it see? It'll see 102, right? Because I said I, I'm running at a lower isolation level. I'm allowed to have dirty reads or unrepeatable reads. So I was able to read what transaction at the top wrote to this table before it, you know, before it actually committed. And then after it rolled back, I went back to the earlier state. And then now the change gets rolled back. And now my, 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 my value got changed. So in some situations for OLAP queries, if you don't care about strong you know, uh, consistency or correctness of the data, you're allowed to have all these different anomalies. You can run these lower isolation levels, and it allows you to get better parallelism. Yeah, so in this case here, it looks like they were grabbing locks. Uh, it might be actually, let's see what happens. If I do this, um, well, no, you, you, can't, you can't read the bottom without being in a transaction without the other guy stolen, right? Um, again, in Postgres, in this case here, MySQL will block. In Postgres, it doesn't block. All right, so at, any, any questions about this? Again, we'll, we'll, we'll play with this more when we, when we do isolation levels next class. Um, Nope. Okay, so that's deadlock detection. The alternative is deadlock prevention, and this is actually what you're implementing in, in Project 3. So what this is, instead of letting transactions acquire locks uh, and then figure out in the background later on whether there's a problem, what you do is basically at the moment they try to acquire a lock, you check to see whether there, somebody else holds that lock, and then you make a decision about, about to do something, right? So this one, you don't have to have a, a sort of separate thread or a wait for a graph or anything in the background. At the moment they go to the lock manager and say, can I have this lock? You decide right then and there whether they should abort, uh, wait a little bit, and then kill them later, or, or kill somebody else that holds the lock that they want. So the way this is going to work is that all the transactions are going to be assigned timestamps that determine the their, their priority. It's basically, the timestamp is like, when did they arrive in the system? And what we'll say is that a older transaction will have a higher priority if they have, if their timestamp is, it comes before the other one. And there's essentially two variants of deadlock perfection are wait and die or wound and wait. So the way basically about this in wait and die, any old transaction that wants to acquire a lock that's being held by another transaction that's younger than them is allowed to wait. And then at some point, you maybe time, time them out and kill them. But you, you, you know, you, you're, always, you're, always, you're, always, you're allowed to wait. But if you're younger than the other person, that you're not allowed to wait. You get aborted. And then the other one is sort of the reverse, right? If the, if the younger guy comes along and the, the slot it needs is being held by a transaction that's older than them, then it's allowed to wait. Otherwise, it waits. Right? So sort of think about it visually like this, right? So at the top, we have T1. T2, T, T1 starts first, but the begin becomes for the begin, begin in T1 occurs before the begin on T2. So therefore, it's going to have a higher priority because this timestamp is going to be older. And then T2, though, acquires the exclusive lock on A, and then T, T1 acquires the exclusive lock on A, but that's being held by T2, so therefore, we have to figure out what to do, right? So under wait and die, T1 is allowed to wait because the old is allowed to wait for the young. Uh, Otherwise, in wound and wait, since T1 is older and therefore has higher priority over the younger transaction, the lock manager will kill T2 and then allow it to, have, to, to give its locks over to the older guy. This bottom one here, T1 starts, it's earlier, and then it gets the lock first. Now T2 starts later and wants to acquire that lock. Uh, under wait and die, T2 will have to abort because the the younger transaction is not, not allowed to wait for the older transaction. Otherwise, in wound and wait, T2 is allowed to wait for, for T1. So why can't there be any deadlocks with this? Right? The issue with the deadlocks before was that any transaction in any order is allowed to wait for anybody else. Right? But under wound and wait and wait and die, we're, we're enforcing that a transaction is only, the waiting is only allowed to go in one direction. The old is allowed to wait for the young, not in the reverse. 
But the young is allowed to wait for the old and not in reverse. So we do that, there's guaranteed to be no deadlocks because it's always in, in that one direction. Then the next thing we got a question is like, how do we, what do we do when, when we start a transaction? Uh, in this case here, we always want to use the original timestamp that we assigned the transaction. When we restart the transaction, we'll give it that same timestamp because when we come back, maybe we were the young, youngest before, but now we're going to be the oldest. So now we'll have priority. So this avoids starvation. If a transaction keeps getting restarted and gets a new timestamp, it's always going to be the youngest, and therefore it's always going to get aborted. So now, again, related to Augusta's question before, if the transaction is a store procedure, this is easy to do because when you come back around the second time and you're invoking that store procedure, you know it's the one you had before, so you just give it the same timestamp. If, uh, if it's in a SQL query, that's a bit more tricky because you don't know whether a new connection, starting a new transaction, is, is the same one you had before or, or if it's completely, completely different. So you don't really know how to reuse that. In the case of project three, you'll, you'll know this. Right? We'll, 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 we'll take care of this for you. All right. So this is, this is basically deadlock prevention. And then I forget, I think what you're doing wait and die in, in project three. Right? So it is follow this, this basic protocol. All right. So we have 10 minutes left, and we can sort of speed through this. Um, the one observation I will make is that the, in all these examples I showed before, there was a one-to-one -one mapping between an object in the database and a lock. Right? And I, for, for the easiest way to think about this, you can think of this one lock per tuple. But now the problem is, let's say I want to update a billion tuples. That means I have to go in the lock manager a billion times and acquire locks for all those billion tuples. Right? And that's actually, as we said, that's an expensive process because you're setting latches on your hash table or whatever the lock table, and you have to then make sure that you, uh, you know, you're doing this for every single tuple you need to acquire or lock you need to acquire. So with lock granularities, what we're going to allow us to do is that we can say now a transaction when it acquires the lock, it's not just going to be on, on, a, on an exact tuple. It could actually be on some... Uh, arbitrary object or element in, in our database, right? It could be on an individual column, it could be on a, on a tuple, a page, a database, a table, right? And the idea here is that we want to allow a transaction to obtain the fewest number of locks that it needs, uh, but still allowing for a lot of parallelism. So there's sort of this trade-off between sort of coarse grain locks and, uh, and having, you know, maximizing the amount of parallelism you can have. Like, so MongoDB, for example, when MongoDB was first implemented, they had a single database lock. So any, anytime you need to write to the database, only one thread could do it. It had to acquire the lock for the entire database. Whereas in Postgres and MySQL and all the other database systems, they could do that at, you know, at a tuple level. So in the case of MongoDB, that's really simple to implement, but you, you reduce the amount of parallelism you have. All right, so the way to sort of look at this is like a hierarchy. So at the very top, you have a database, and then you have a tables, and then tuples have tables, and or sorry, tu tables have tuples, and tuples have attributes. So we can acquire locks at any, any of these different levels in the tree. So if our transaction comes along, T1, uh, and it wants to make a modification, maybe it takes a lock on the table, and then, then this implicitly acquires all the locks for all the elements below it. Right? So it's a hierarchy. If you acquire a lock to, something, to something's parent in the tree, you implicitly have a lock for, for everything below it. So let's look through an example here. So say that we have two transactions, T1, T2. T1 wants to get my balance of my offshore Cayman Islands bank account. And then the uh, T2 wants to increase Joy's bank account balance by doing 1%. So the question is, you know, what kind of locks should we acquire? Again, having this trade-off by minimizing the number of locks we need to acquire, but also sort of maximizing the amount of parallelism we can have in our current transactions. So for this, we're going to use the uh, exclusive and shared locks for the leaf, the leaf nodes in our lock tree. So in that, that example here, I have we had attributes. Typically, you don't take locks on attributes. So it's usually the tuples. But now we're going to introduce a new type of locks called intention locks that we're going to use at the higher levels of the tree that are going to provide hints to other transactions that come along and say, there's another transaction that's actually doing something down below. Uh, and that way I can get a hint about what's going on without having to go down and scan everything. So an attention lock is basically a way to say at a higher level that down below there'll be a shared exclusive mode lock, 
but you don't need to go down and check the individual elements to figure out what's going on. So this allows you to figure out earlier or in your, in your lock manager, figure out, oh, is there something going on down below that would cause me to have a conflict, and therefore I should abort my transaction or deny it from getting the request right now. Because what you don't want to have happen is maybe somebody, there's a billion tuples, and someone needs to acquire a lock for just one tuple, but then uh, it's the last tuple on the list, and some other transaction holds the lock for, for everything else, um, and you don't find out to the end that, that when you get down there that, like, the, that one transaction can prevent you from actually acquiring the lock that you need. All right, so we have basically three types of intention locks. We have intention shared. Basically it says that at a higher level, this intention shared lock says that there's explicit shared level locking going down at the bottom. Uh, intention exclusive basically says that, uh, same thing, right? At, the, at a higher level, someone has intention lock that says there's exclusive locks going on explicitly down below. The one that always trips up students is the shared intention exclusive lock. And this basically says that the node will be explicitly locked in shared mode at the moment at, at where, where you have the shared intention lock. But then below that, you'll have exclusive mode locks. So I'm rushing this, but hopefully an example will, will make this more clear. But just in terms of a compatibility matrix, this is sort of the same thing I showed at the beginning, but now it's much bigger. Now we have all of these different types of uh, uh, lock modes. And so what we see is that the uh, exclusive lock is always going to be incompatible with everything else. But now with these sh intention locks, in some cases we, we, can, we can intermix them. In some cases we cannot. So let me just go through one example, and then we'll finish up for the day. And then I'll pick up on this in next class. All right, so to say that, again, my first transaction wants to read my bank account record, my balance, right? So I want to read a single record in, in our table, R. For this now, I'm only having a two-level hierarchy. We're not doing database locks. We're not doing attribute locks. We just have tables, and we have tuples. So all I need to do is just read this one tuple here. So what will happen is, when I, in my lock manager, when I start acquiring locks, I can take the, uh, an intention shared lock on the table. And this will say that then down below, now there's an, a shared lock on that single tuple that I need. So you always have to take locks on your way down to the tree, right? So now, if, if, I, if transaction T2 wants to update Joy's bank account, he will get here, and it'll take an intention exclusive lock on the table, which is compatible with the intention shared lock, right? There are just hints to say that, that, that down below there's, there's exclusive and shared locks going on. And then it can take the exclusive lock on that tuple over there to do the right, and these don't conflict, and ev everything's fine, right? So any questions about intention locks? Again, we'll cover this. I'll pick up on, on class next time and cover this in more detail. Yes? When you have a transaction, the three tokens and one can write to double N, how does it get to know that it's not made at this point? OK, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll jump ahead with this. All right. So say we have three transactions. I think this is what you're saying. So I have transaction T1 wants to read an R, read the table, then update a few tuples. And then the uh, T2 wants to read a single tuple. T3 wants to scan all the tuples. OK? So T1 comes along. It wants to scan and update a few tuples. Right? So say that it wants to read T1, T2. And then the last one here, I'll do a read and write. So for here, we'll take a shared intention exclusive lock. Because this now says that I'm taking all the, the tuples below. I'm taking a shared lock on them because I want to read them. But then it'll also take a single exclusive lock on that one tuple that it actually needs to modify. So implicitly, T1 and T2 here are in, uh, are in under shared, shared locks. But I don't have to go to the lock manager and ask for that because I had the shared intention exclusive lock above it. All right, so now, in this case here, I only had to go to the lock manager twice, whereas if I have to take shared locks all the way in the bottom, then I have to take, you know, I have to grab all those locks. Now, T2 wants to read a single tuple in R. Uh, so it wants to read this one here. It's not the one we're writing to. So it can take an intention shared lock, which is, which is compatible with the shared intention exclusive lock. So therefore, it's allowed to then go down further and get the share lock on that one here. But now my third transaction that actually wants to scan the entire, entire thing here, uh, I want to get a shared lock on the entire table because I'm going to read the entire table. This is not compatible with the shared intention exclusive lock. So I'll get denied at this point here, and I'll wait before that, that one lock gets released before I can go down and, and acquire everything else. Right? 
So think, and think about this. Without the multiple granularities, if I want to scan the entire table, I would start over here and take every single share lock as I go along, and then finally get to the last one and go, oh, oh this is an exclusive lock. I can't acquire the share lock I need. So then my transaction would get aborted. So I would have done wasted work by acquiring all these locks when it's the last one I need is, is, is I can't acquire anyway. So I did wasted work. So this is providing hints ahead of time to say, there's something going on down below. Figure out whether you're, you're going to be able to do the thing that you want to do. Uh, and figure out early on to, to, to deny you from acquiring the locks that you need so that you don't do a bunch of wasted work. I sort of like, and with cascading aborts, we want to avoid the case where we're, we're doing much of stuff that, we're, you know, we want to avoid the case where we're doing much of work that we're going to have to roll back later on. In this case here, the work we're trying to avoid is going to the lock manager. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Um, I'll, 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 this is a bit rushed at the end. I'll pick up on this on, on next time. Uh, and then I think homework five is going out tonight. And this, this will be due, due much later. Okay? Any questions? All right, guys, see you on Wednesday.